I'm a Zeke Hausfather, I'm with Berkeley Earth, and I'm studying the surface temperature record and how to deal with all the biases and issues in it. Berkeley Earth is a uh, reanalysis or reassessment rather than a reanalysis of, of global surface temperatures uh, using a slightly different approach than most of the other groups that have done in the past. Um, so prior to this project, there really was a single database that everyone used, uh, four major groups used to reconstruct uh, global land temperatures, and that was what's called the Global Historical Climatological Network, monthly. Uh, it had about 7,000 stations, dropping to about 1,900 in recent years. And uh, the fact that it was a somewhat small database, you know, had relative areas of little spatial coverage, Arctic, Africa, places like that, uh, and there was such a dramatic change in the availability of data within the network led to uh, a number of folks asking questions about whether or not any of these factors might be causing bias. Um, so what the Berkeley effort was, was an attempt to take a lot more data, about 40,000 stations, um, and use homogenization methods that were different, uh, but similar in, in general principle to what uh, the National Climate Data Center does with their GHCN data and, and what NASA's uh, Goddard Institute of Space Studies uses from NCDC. Uh, and also use a, a slightly more um, complex spatial interpolation technique, so to fill in all the area between these individual stations uh, using an approach called Krieging, which was actually um, taken from sort of the geology uh, mineral exploration space instead of what had been used to date, which is a simple sort of nearest neighbor infilling um, spatial interpolation. Uh, at the end of the day, the results really weren't that different. Um, globally, there's pretty identical uh, trends, slightly higher in recent years actually than most other records, um, very similar to the, the new Counting and Way uh, series, uh, unsurprisingly since we both used very similar methods. Um, and uh, it also provided a really good uh, sort of independent replication of the U.S. temperature record because unlike the rest of the world, the U.S. has very large adjustments required because of biases in the data primarily two things, uh, time of observation changes, so moving when you take the temperature from the afternoon to the morning, and um, instrument changes, changing from liquid and glass thermometers to electronic instruments. Uh, and the net effect of both of these and a few other things is to essentially make the raw temperature record, the reading of the thermometers, about half, uh, warm about half as much as what should actually be happening when you correct for those biases. Um, obviously, the fact that the homogenized the adjusted temperature data is warming twice as fast as the raw data, you know, caused a lot of people to um, raise questions about it, particularly those who are predisposed to disagree with the temperature record. Um, so I think one of the more useful things to come out of the Berkeley effort, at least, was this sort of independent replication of U.S. temperatures that are pretty much identical to uh, what the National Climate Data Center found using a completely different method. You um, allude to this, uh, I guess, suspicion of homogenization methods, mm -hmm. once you replicate it, did you find that suspicion in homogenization methods decrease? Among some people, yes. Uh, not necessarily among others. Um, I mean, the, frankly, the general public doesn't know or understand anything about homogenization methods. We're mostly talking here about you know folks who enjoy arguing about this sort of thing on the internet or in, in particularly uh, technical-oriented publications and forum not the peer-reviewed literature per se, but there, where there wasn't really ever that much uncertainty, but sort of in between the lay public and the peer-reviewed literature. Um, there, I think we've changed a few minds, but uh, not as many as I would have hoped. It's sort of a, an ongoing battle because there's this certain appeal to using the raw data, even if we know that the raw data may be sus uh, subject to large systemic biases. At the end of the day, I think that for us as a society to take the action we need to take on the climate issue, um, we need to have more agreement on the science. And I think that there is a pretty big divide between this sort of group of academic scientists who write in the peer-reviewed literature and a lot of, of fairly intelligent people, a surprising number of them engineers, um, who you know, sort of come to their own conclusions, often through things they find on the internet or sort of limited sets of information. And I think there is, there's certainly a, a set of folks who you're never going to convince, um, for whom this issue is mostly ideological. But there's also a, what I would say is a pretty sizable middle of folks who, you know, might have some initial impressions. You know, they might be initially skeptical of, you know, what environmental groups say or what other folks who might have, you know, slightly different uh, political views than them say. Uh, but they can be swayed by the science, and specifically, they can be swayed by showing them 
sort of from start to finish how you approach a problem, how you take a particular data set that they themselves could take if they so wanted, how you analyze it, what result you get, and how robust that result is to your choices. And you know, we see this in, in global surface temperature data. Um, around 2010, uh, there was this neat little movement to, of independent folks doing their own temperature analyses. Um, so I did my own, uh, a fellow Nick Stokes did his own uh, reconstruction. Even some of the skeptics, uh, a fellow named Jeff Id with, and a statistician named Roman uh, did their own method. Um, and all of us, you know, pretty much found identical results. Uh, Grant Foster, uh, who's a statistician, also did his own approach. Um, and it was kind of neat, because before then, we'd only really had the, the big three uh, governmental groups. And it was kind of neat to have all these bloggers and, and otherwise sort of non-professional climate scientists going through the data, doing their own analysis, and getting the same results. And I think that did actually change a lot of minds on that particular issue. Um, you know, there's still other things people are going to argue about, and it's always a, a game of whack-a-mole. Um, but I think that sort of a, a strong data-based approach to uh, communications and, and journalism for that particular set of folks, the sort of the engineers of the world, uh, is an effective means of communication. What's your trick to um, staying patient and unruffled in the, in the face of hostile readers? Just don't take it personally, um, <laughs> especially what strangers say to you on the internet. And I, and I found, you know, the funny thing about all this is, is people tend to be a lot meaner online than they are in real life. And when you meet all these people, you know, a lot of the people who you would argue with on the internet, um, they actually tend to be pretty decent, nice people. You know, I even had a chance to meet up with uh, our, our favorite cowboy, Willis Eschenbach, at uh, the Burning Man Festival, which was probably the last place on earth I thought I'd see <laughs> someone I argue with the internet who's an arch climate contrarian. Um, and you know, everyone, everyone's nice in person. There's just something about the internet that just leads people to behave a lot more caustically to each other than they otherwise would if they were sitting in front of you having a conversation. Um, and I think you kind of need to bear that in mind that all these people aren't actually mean in real life all the time. They're just sort of they're passionate, you know, they have their own political views, and, and frankly, you know, our own views can shape a lot of our opinions. Um, I see that in a lot of my friends who, you know, are more left liberal leaning in the US and their views on things like genetically engineered foods or vaccines, and, you know, we, those arguments are tough to have. And so I could see how people, you know, who have views that lead them to um, disagree with the implications of climate science in terms of policy would translate that into a view on the science itself, and, and that requires a certain amount of patience to approach them. What tips would you have for scientists in particular who are trying to communicate science to the public? Don't talk down to your audience and don't underestimate them. Um, you know, my friend, uh, and in many ways a person I look up to a lot, Gavin Schmidt, he's a great communicator, but one of the biggest mistakes he ever made uh, was in a public debate uh, when he, you know, essentially said at the podium, this is you know, they're confusing you, you know, this is too complicated for you guys to understand easily. Um, trust me, I'm a scientist sort of approach. And, and I think that sort of approach uh, by itself uh, really turns people off. Um, I think that appeals to consensus are useful if accompanied by other information around the issue. I think by themselves or appeals to authority are not necessarily productive. Um, and sort of on the flip side of that is, you know, your audience is smart enough to understand your argument, and so don't be afraid to be a little bit technical. I mean, don't go completely off the rails into jargon-filled things that your audience can never understand, but you know, treat your audience like grown-ups. Um, maybe if you need to have an addendum at the end of something you're writing, but provide them the details and provide them uh, the data sources, the links to the peer-reviewed publications so people can follow and, and look it up themselves. Because um, a surprising number of people actually spend, enjoy spending far too much time looking into these things. Well, it's, it's, it's really simple at the heart of it. I mean, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. No one disagrees with that. Even the you know, most arch climate skeptics in the world who are in academia, the Dick Lindsons of the world, still say that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. And heat-seeking missiles wouldn't work if CO2 wasn't a greenhouse gas. The military would obviously have some issues with that. Um, humans are responsible for the bulk of modern CO2 emissions. We can measure it. We know how much we're burning. We know how much is accumulating in the atmosphere. It's not very difficult, and so it's very easy to figure that out. Um, and increased CO2 causes warming because CO2 is a greenhouse gas. You know, the radiative physics of that are, are easily and well understood. So if you accept those things, you know, CO2 emissions, or, oh, the third part is atmospheric CO2 is increasing. Again, we have really good measurements of this from ice cores and other things, and there's really no uncertainty in that. So if you accept those three things, CO2 is increasing, humans are responsible for most of the additional CO2 in the atmosphere, 
and CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and so more of it causes warming, then humans are responsible for global warming to some extent or another. And you know, I think just emphasizing those three things gets us a long way. There's plenty to argue about in the details around what is climate sensitivity and exactly how much of the warming in different periods of time are humans responsible for. But at the end of the day, the world is warming. We are responsible for certainly a portion of it, and, and most people think a large portion of it. Um, and there's very good reason to think that um, because of, of those simple reasons. There's just something about the semi anonymity and anonym, anonym, anonymousness of the internet uh, leads. Is that a word? Anonymousness? Ness? <laughs> Anonymity? I don't know what the <laughs> form is.